Oh, I apologize. I apologize because I wrote it down and the student just came in. I wanted her to have it. There's a quiz. This is, yeah, please don't take a picture of this. But wait, will they have it on a piece of paper that they take away? No? They can't. Yeah, no. They can't. This is the whole idea behind this Sorry. exercise is to see what they Sorry. actually know that they have to go back and actually review. Okay. Okay. y'all get what letter did you get for number one? H. All right, good, because y'all need to know that for the test tomorrow. And every time you see a blood pressure from now until you get out of this program, it would be good of you to actually calculate a math. Because if the math is not within this range and they're breathing, you're likely to address something about this math. Okay, so. All right, what about the next one? <coughs> CTD. I ICP. They're asking for the normal range for ICP, which is what? C. 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 Okay. Yeah, so if you don't, y'all had ICP in third level. Okay, so most of this stuff, actually, all of this stuff. Is should be reviewed for you, and if you don't know it, you'll see, you need to know it. So, cerebral perfusion pressure, what did y'all get for that? Okay. Yep. All righty. 
Oh, A is an apple. Brad Scout Coma Scale score, what's the range? G. G, right? Okay, good, yeah. All right. So, sodium. D. D is in dog. D is in dog. Yeah, look, it's hard to hear up here. Uh, five? I mean, I'm sorry. Second number four? Yeah, the second number four. No, we did second number four. Now we're actually moving on to number six. Sorry. Which is number five. Which is potassium. Um, B. B. I mean, yeah. Yeah, y'all better pay attention to the difference between equivalents and grams per liter. Ah, yeah. Dirty dog. <laughs> All right, so what'd y'all get for albumin? B. That would be B. Mm -hmm. it is, and and y'all need to pay attention between the differences in these because you will see both of these because, all right, let's answer the last one. By process of elimination, D. E. 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 And all of these values are straight off of your lab sheet that is printed that you should be filling out each week in clinical and when you're looking at your patients. I know in the ICU, you probably are looking at labs all day long and writing them down. With me right now, there are, for, the, for those of y'all who are doing your plan of care, you've already done this. And I bring up albumin and total protein because what do those two values, what kind of information about the patient's status will an albumin and a total protein give you? Oh, nutrition. Nutrition, exactly. Those are the two things you're looking at when you're trying to, who, who's the one who had the patient, who's doing their plan of care yesterday that had the low albumin? I mean, uh, yeah, low albumin, who was it? I can't remember. Mine's blue. Yours? Okay, and you might have had, who am I choosing? I think whoever was in my Wednesday group, who obviously is him, mm -hmm. um, had the same patient. So y'all need to pay, yeah, y'all need to pay attention to those things, okay? But you'll see these things um, on your test. <coughs> All right, so I have to use this clicker. So just as a review, these are things you need to know. Your range of your map, your range of your CPPs, your range of your labs. Now, another kicker, serum sodium. Why our book has one dirt? 136 to 145, and the rest of the world is 135 to 145. I don't know, but I'm not gonna add, you know, put something on the test that's like that low to one end or the other. But I will tell you that when a patient is receiving hypertonic saline, and you draw a sodium after they receive that, it is perfectly acceptable for it to go up to 150 and still be normal, being as they just received hypertonic saline. So write that down. And if y'all listen to it, y'all actually heard my boring voice already. This is a diagram showing the management of care with severe brain injuries. I need you to bring this diagram to class because we're going to discuss it and there's a couple of updated changes on here that I need you to uh, fix. Okay. Shut up. All right, good. Now, going back to that diagram again, that is the algorithm or the um, that is from the American Association of Neuroscience Nurses. And they use this 
as their standard of care for a patient with a traumatic brain injury. So when you're studying this content, you'll want to look at these things. Whatever numbers I gave you um, on that lecture coincides with these numbers, like the CPP from 60 to 50 to 70. Um, <coughs> in fact, let me pull this up and make sure there's nothing. Because we're going to address all of these things in between your video and between our class activities today, we're going to hit on all of this. All right. So I don't know if they give you any other number. So elevated head of bed. This says zero to thirty, but the and I don't know why they put it on there, but the literature wants them to keep at least thirty. You don't lay anybody flat, even if they have a corresponding spinal cord injury. You're gonna, they're gonna put the bed at an angle, even if they're laying on a spine board. They're gonna be at a little bit of an angle so that their head is at maintaining at 30 degrees. Hear me? What, what do you think do, it does to their ICT when they're laying totally flat? <laughs> it increases it. Now, when you sit them up, okay, if they're not on a spine board and they're able to sit up, Comfort is somewhere between 30 and 45. I need you just to remember, no 90 either, because what kind of, if they're at a 90 degree angle, they have a bend in their body, and what do you think that does to their ICP? It elevates it, okay? So laying flat elevates it, putting them at a 90 elevates it. So do not sit them up like that. Even when they get to the point where if they're extubated and we're feeding them, don't put them straight up at a night, okay? I don't see anybody hardly in the hospital totally sitting at a 90 because that's not very comfortable. Now PT will put them in that and they don't like it and they like, can you put, bring the head of my bed down? Maybe, maybe when we're extubating them. Maybe, the bed, yeah, maybe when they take the portable chest. Even that is harsh, but yeah. close to it. I've seen them, up. them, I mean, when they do a portable chest x-ray on somebody, they'll try to send them up at a 90, and they're not particularly crazy about that, whether they're intubated or not, okay? Just sharp angles like that, no good, all right? So we're going to talk about all of these things. A lot of this stuff you've already had before. Okay, uh, but I made this case study and we're gonna go over this case study and you're going to use the information that I gave you from the recording, from the two articles, from this algorithm so that we can answer these questions and I'll add in a little bit more because I'm a trauma expert. I'm not expecting you to be a trauma expert but some of these things are, because some of you may want to go and work in the TICU at university when you get out of school. Head trauma in TICU, okay? It's specifically head trauma. Well, I'm lying. It's mostly head trauma, though. It's bleeds and head trauma, and bleeds could be spontaneous or could be from trauma. So you need to know these things because these are the patients you're going to be taking care of. Okay, so <coughs> for right now, and I've had umpteen patients like this, you have a patient that is 36 years old, and they're brought in by their coworker. They didn't call the EMS, they brought in straight off the street. They fell approximately 10 feet from the roof of a one-story home. They're obviously either fixing the roof or redoing it or whatever, or maybe they were just up there for whatever reason. And if you see people roofing on one-story buildings, how many of them do you see wearing safety harnesses? None. Maybe if they get a good contractor for second floor, they will for liability, but most of them don't. And they slide off roofs. Whether they're straight, drunk, or high, or whatever, they fall off roofs, okay? So this particular patient fell off the roof and they landed on the lawn 
which is grassy, which is a softer surface in concrete, but still they hit their head, okay? So they come in, they're awake, alert, and oriented, um, and they have a hematoma to the right frontal area. So we're talking about right around here, okay? It's visible. The patient is brought, put in a bed in the back, placed in a gown, laying in the bed. You're the nurse taking care of them. So if you listen to my video, which I hope you did, what's one of the first things you want to apply? What type of device? A cervical collar. Why? What did I say in the video about anybody with head trauma? You assume they have a cervical spine injury until proven otherwise. So they will have a cervical collar applied. All right. Um, if they came in by EMS, they were already going to be on a spine board and a seat collar, but I purposely made this one a walk-in a walk off the street person. Because I can't tell you how many people have driven straight up from an accident, they defer EMS, and then we slap them in a seat collar in a trauma unit. But this is not, let's play this isn't university. So I'm not going to put them on a spine board. They're not bad enough, we're not going to put them on a spine board. But we're going to put a collar on, okay? So, Initials assessment that the nurse is going to do, which doesn't deviate from any other assessment. All right, oh, but well, before we get to that, let's f finish. C collar. What other equipment are you going to attach to this patient? They're in the ER or they're in the ICU. <coughs> well, no, that comes later. That, that, that's that, that's going to come later. But devices, what are you going to attach to them? A cardiac monitor, okay. Um, on our floor, we have telemetry, but we have monitoring devices, okay. Uh, let's see, what else are we putting up on there? Okay. We're working on two computers here. Oh, what about what, what are you going to put on their finger? All signs, okay, all right, because you want to get all those vital signs on them, and then you're gonna do what? What other piece of equipment are you likely gonna put on them? Blood pressure cuff, right? Okay, hold on a set of vital signs, all right? What else? This patient had trauma. What's our fifth vital sign? Pain. Pain. So, they're awake alert, they're oriented. They speak English. What kind of adult pain scale do we historically use? The zero to 10 score, right? So, you're asking them on a scale from zero to 10, zero is no pain, 10, I usually say you got hit by a bus, but that's my crazy. But are, it's the worst pain you ever felt in your life. What's your pain number, right? You always ask that. And in this case, the patient says that they've got a five out of 10 headache going on, okay? All right, so initial assessments. Well, we already did that. Okay, we got our vitals. We got, in fact, I'll even tell you what their vitals are. We've got their vitals are 130 over 70. Heart rate is 80, respiration is 18, temperature is 98.9, and they're 100% on the All righty. Heart rate is 80. Eight, yeah, eight zero. And they're in a sinus rhythm according to their monitor. Alrighty, so 
Video education, so they don't need to move into anything. Well, we haven't gotten to that yet. We're doing initial assessments in order. We got their vitals, okay, because we always get their vitals. Then we'll do their assessments. Or in my case, I tell y'all, knock out their assessments first because somebody's coming around and doing your vitals. But we got our vitals, but when we go to our initial assessment of a trauma patient, and that's, I believe, you know, on one of your slides or a handout or something that I gave y'all, it doesn't deviate. What do we automatically do first? Starts with the letter of oh, airway. Airway, exactly. <laughs> I'm looking at this patient. They're talking to me, so I know they got a patent airway. They're breathing, right? I've done some circulation because I've done vital signs on them and all of that, but now I'm doing my basic head to toe on them. All right? So I'm checking my pulses, I'm looking at the skin color, I'm touching them, I'm feeling, are they warm, are they clammy? All of that. Breathing, we already assessed the fact that they're breathing. I'm listening to their breath sounds, clear as a bell. Anterior and posterior, okay? Circulation, we're doing all of that. D, what does D mean? Disabilities, and what kind of disabilities are we referring to? Neuro disabilities, that's your D. So what, my people should know this, especially, what, starting on their head, are we gonna do for their neuro assessment? Pupillary response, okay? Shine the light, that's why you always have a pen light, you shine the light, and also, if you're doing, if you're gonna write Perla, you gotta do their accommodation as well, all right? Now, of course, this, yeah, this person can do accommodation even if they got the seat collar, they're not moving, they're just moving their eyes, right? Because we're bringing it up down to the side and then forward to see if they cross their eyes. We already got that they are awake, alert, and oriented. What else when, oh, let me go on, because I've pretty much done that. Uh, all of the other stuff, other than the five out of 10 head pain and the right hematoma to the head, no other signs of trauma, all right? What kind of health history do you get on everybody? What do you ask them? Everything. Three things. Allergies. Allergies? This person has no allergies, no known allergies. Take it. Current medications. Current medications. They take no medications. They're 36, normal, healthy, to their knowledge. Okay. And then, what else? We said meds. We said what? Uh, now we've got health history, but what other kind of history do we get? Social history. What consists of a social history? Do they drink alcohol? Occasionally, but not on a daily basis and was not drinking today. What else? Drugs. Do they do drugs? This guy, occasional marijuana, okay, but not today. Caffeine. Caffeine intake? Sure. Any other drugs. Any other drugs, exactly. Not just marijuana. And you've got to explain that to some people because some people out there, patients, oh, I smoke a little weed. That's a drug. Oh, okay. you got to clarify. you got to look at who you're working with. Marijuana. Do you, so I just used to give my, do you do crack? Do you smoke weed? Do you, I put it because my patient clientele did that. I needed to know that. I'm like, I'm not the police. I don't need to know. I, I'm not going to rat on you. I need to know what's in your body. Because we're going to do a urine test. We're going to do a top screen. Okay, so I need to know what's on board. What, what do you have in your system right now? Okay. So this patient fell. They hit their head. They got the hematoma. But no obvious bleeding or anything. What kind of head trauma is this? No, is it blunt. Blunt, blunt trauma? Blunt trauma is worse, at least with penetrating, I can see what I'm working with. Blunt trauma, you don't know what's going on. Did y'all watch the video about 
the head bouncing back and forth. I put that up there because that was a much better visual representation of how the brain bounces around in the hard skull when they sustain trauma. I'm not going to test you on what is an acceleration, deceleration, but you need to understand that the skull is a hard surface. When that brain goes hitting this away, that away, or that away, or that away, or that away, or that away, it's bouncing around and it's hitting hard surface. So depending upon the force at which it hits that surface and whether they were moving, that's a little bit of physics, if they were moving and they get hit, it's better than if they were standing still and then boom, they got hit. So your motor vehicle accidents, if they're stationary at a red light and somebody plows into the back of them, that's gonna be worse on their head because y'all saw in the video how their neck is going this way. That's why we always say we suspect a cervical spine injury when you had head trauma, head trauma okay? All right. What kind of information about this accident do you want to find out? This is a little bit of basic trauma question that you want to ask them. Did they break their fall with their arms? You could ask, did you extend your arms? Now we've already assessed, because we would have already assessed, do you have any pain? We already assessed them. But how did you break the fall? That's another good one, because a lot of people will hyperextend their hands and they'll get wrist fractures, arm fractures, but this guy was lucky for some ungodly reason he bounced well and all he did was bop his head. No other visible trauma. Did, we know he fell from 10 feet. That's important too because the longer you fall, the more trauma you're likely to sustain. All right, and remember, not all trauma is visible. Some of it's inside, so that's why we're gonna do a bunch of diagnostics on him, right? What's another thing, especially for neuro patients, that you want to ask them? Did you lose consciousness? Do you remember everything that happened? And he's like, oh yeah, no, I remember falling off that roof and hit my head. But there are some patients who have no recollection. That's worse. If you cannot recall the injury, or the, or the accident, that's worse. It's called amnesia to the events. You have amnesia to the events, okay? Fancy word. Um, so we wanna know how far, we wanna know if they have any other, what, you know, what kind of surface did you hit? Because if you hit your head on concrete, you're gonna do more damage than if you hit your head on a softer thing like the ground, okay? Unless the ground is really hard, but I promise you the ground is lighter than concrete, okay? All right, so now we'll get to your interventions. We already put them on all this stuff. What kind of interventions are you think this patient's gonna need? Well, that's a diagnostic, but as far as like other interventions, we're gonna get a laundry list of orders. Huh? Well, yeah, how are you gonna give it to them? IV. You need an IV, you need IV access. If there are trauma patients, they're gonna get historically two large bores, 18. If they come in by EMS, who knows? Well, I don't know, nowadays EMS doesn't even put in, sadly, they don't do active checks and they don't sometimes put in lines, bless their hearts. But anyway, so we have Stephanie's A, Stephanie's EMT. She's like, what you talking about with the like, well, I'm, 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 well, shame on them. Exactly, <laughs> shame on them for not putting a line in them and not doing an accurate check on somebody. Because that's a, that's a quick and dirty you can do. So anyway, so we're gonna get two large four IVs. And what are we gonna do? Also, how am I gonna know what's going on um, with their, like their blood stuff? What is everything? CMP, that's your basic, or well, probably a CMP because they're trauma. A basic metabolic panel doesn't include, I think a man 
or something like that. But we're going to get a CMP on them, right? That includes your mag and some other stuff. Um, what problem do you need? Toxic. Toxic. Maybe, 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 but we're not drawing that, that's, right, yeah, unless we're going to do a good one. Huh? We might get a whole slew of stuff on that, but for right now, your basic stuff, oh, he had trauma. Every trauma patient, you're suspect, suspecting they may go to surgery. They may receive what? <laughs> say it loud, say it proud if you oh, said it. Blood. It's type of cross. Type of cross, exactly. Okay. 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 And then if you get the type of cross, and they may go to surgery, what other diagnostic, I mean, excuse me, what other lab? What's part of that rainbow, as we call it, in, the, in the, I guess most of it's light blue. PT, PTT, coagulation studies. Yes, that's a basic panel we're gonna get. Oh, and that's just blood. What other liquid specimens are we gonna get? Urine. Urine. Urine analysis as well as, because we don't believe our patients when they tell us. You tox, people lie. So we're going to, but we need to know and what they've got on board, so we're going to get. Oh, and he was injured on the job site. Their employer's going to want to know that too. Mm -hmm. So we're going to get a UA, a UTOX, because they had trauma. We need to know if they had enough trauma that it messed with their kidneys. Okay. All right, and if they've got some kind of something or other on board. Now, diagnostic tests. What are we going to get? CAT scan, with or without contrast? Without. With is usually if you're trying to find some type of a mass, um, but head leads show up without contrast, okay? So this patient is gonna get a CT without contrast. Now, they've got that C collar on them, so what other kind of diagnostics are we gonna get? X-rays, exactly, C-spine. And if he complained of anything else, any other extremity or anything else, they would get. Um, that, would, that would come later if it was belly pain. A lot of times the trauma centers are gonna do a belly fast on anybody anyway. That's an ultrasound of their abdomen to see if they're bleeding internally. That's trauma protocol. I didn't wanna get that technical, but since you asked. Um, so we're sending them off. We're gonna get all these labs first. We're gonna send those off, and then the person's gonna to go to CAT scan, okay? Any questions thus far related to this patient? Did I miss anything? Are you curious about anything? Because this is really your time to ask and clarify. Would you make it into Oh yeah, yeah, no. Nobody gets to eat in the ER. You should eat before you come in. <laughs> because you're not getting fed. Because we're putting you NPO. Because what if you go to surgery? You're going to be NPO. <coughs> so no, nothing to eat, nothing to drink. Not even ice chips. And explain to them, teach your patient. Don't just say, I can't give you anything to eat or drink. Because they're going to say, why not? I'm thirsty. I've been out in the sun all day working and I fell off my roof. Because if you go to surgery, we need to make sure that you don't vomit on yourself and choke to death. Put it in layman's terms because they don't understand. We're going to intubate you, and then you might ask for it. They don't know all those words. Put it to them in terms. We might have them too down your throat if we take you to surgery, and then you could vomit, and then you could choke to death. That is why we keep your cell. That is why we keep you nothing by mouth. Explain to your patients. Patient teaching is one of the most important things we can do for our patients. And then they know you're not just being the meanie nurse. They know, okay, they're out for my best interest. They don't want me to choke to death. That's, that's always a good thing. All right, so. Moving right along. They 
they go get sent for their x-rays, they get their CT. They're in the CT scanner and they <coughs> lose consciousness. Right, bro, that's not a good thing. Especially with a neuro patient, right? They call the rapid response, because they were still breathing. They call the rapid, they didn't call the code, he just lost, lost consciousness. But the rapid response was called, they went ahead because he lost consciousness Anybody that loses consciousness with head trauma, they're going to err on the side of caution and intubate them because they could lose their airway at any given moment. And going back to something, I forgot to mention something, that you're also gonna get in the ER. What's another test? It's not a physical test, it's a questioning test that we're gonna ask every head trauma patient. Well, we already oriented them, right, Chair, but what's another score we're gonna obtain? Last oh, uh, uh, scale score, right, Chair. And I mentioned that again, I apologize, it's, this is the, my first time doing it this semester, so I come back and it, it all comes back to me. But the Glasgow Coma Scale, which y'all already had in level three, I know because I talked to Ms. Sanders. You know, I make sure that I know what you had, okay? Now, we already said on our matching exercise, lowest score is three, highest score is 15. Rule of thumb with a patient who has a Glasgow Coma Scale score of eight or below, we're gonna intubate them on to, on the, to err on the side of caution. Okay, because it's easier to intubate somebody before they fall out, because we can give them drugs to knock them out, than it is, and plus two with trauma, and I'm teaching y'all burns as well. Any airway swelling, anything like that, it's hard to intubate, and you really wanna orally intubate them and not have to nasally intubate them, or do a trade on them. Now, you see that stuff out in the field, and, and heroic stuff, but you definitely wanna try to intubate them under rapid sequence induction, which is drugs. A paralytic, I'm not asking you this, but it's a paralytic and a sedation. But y'all know about propofol. That's sedation of choice. Um, and I've had it, and it's wonderful. And I understand why Michael Jackson had an attraction to it because it's so much nicer to have for a, for a quick and dirty procedure because there's no hangover effect. It's a rapid onset and it's a um, it's a, got a rapid half life. But you wake up after propofol, right as rain, you don't have the nausea or, or the lingering effects of the benzos. So when you get old like me and Ms. Garrison and gotta have a colonoscopy, you get away from them all. <laughs> yeah, they dip her band, and honey, it knocks you out. Yes. Yeah, I love it. It's been fun. It but does. it sometimes does a little number on the blood pressure. So you're always going to, any time you're doing, and because if you work in some kind of like dental clinic, oral surgery, you will be doing conscious sedation, and they do things like propofol. And you got to watch, because when they're on all the monitoring systems you're watching, they're all O2 sat. You're putting them on prophylactic, um, I don't probably not a number either, but you will put them on some kind of supplemental O2 for it because you know that their respirations are gonna go down when they start getting this and their O2 sats may go down, okay? So this patient has now bought a bed in the neuro ICU. Now, you already had vents, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whether they got Put on a ventilator because of head trauma, because of cardiac issues or whatever, put them on mechanical ventilation, protocols are the same. They all have the same issues that we're worried about with a patient that's on mechanical ventilation. I'm not testing you on a mechanical ventilation, so you're getting that test one. I am. There you go, she is, okay? So I want you to understand that the same rules apply to a patient who is put on a ventilator for any other type of medical problem, 
all right? We're still worried about them developing that. So we're still doing all of the protocols related to that, okay? So what you're learning on test one, the material you're learning on test one is going to haunt you for the entire semester. In other words, you're responsible for knowing it. I'm not gonna ask you, like I said, I'm, my gig is head trauma. I'm gonna focus more on the head trauma, but when you're studying, you have to understand and picture this patient on a ventilator in an ICU with the C-collar arm and the head trauma and the sedation and all the monitors. They're not getting the cardiac drugs because that's not their problem. They're getting other drugs and we're gonna talk about that, okay? All right, I'm being mindful of my time. I got three minutes before I give you your break because I'm all about union rules and giving me a 10 minute break. It's <laughs> a long line a lot of times. Mm -hmm. So hourly interventions. Well, I'm sorry, let's go back. Are yet assessments gonna change? Do they ever change? You're gonna focus, uh, do a, a little bit more of a neuro exam on them because they're a neuro patient. But you don't ever deviate from the order of A, B, C, D, E, E, and let me clarify with Ian, I think I think I put this on the video already. E is you still gotta pull the covers back when you're doing a head to toe assessment and you need to look at them because you don't know what's going on under the covers until it's too late to see blood saturate. You're, you're, that's never a good sign, okay? So do yourself a favor. Your patient, you're always gonna pull the covers back. You're gonna expose them to see what might have cropped up since your last assessment. You are going to turn them. Now, a patient who is intubated, who has a C collar on them, who we're suspecting of any kind of trauma your log rolling. Y'all learned about log rolling in some kind of whatever. I don't know if it was first level for transition people. I don't know if y'all got it in third level, but you do know that log rolling is a mechanism of turning a patient to maintain spinal alignment, all of their spine. They're laying flat. Somebody's at the head of the bed, maintaining neutral alignment of the neck because all of your breathing apparatus and everything else you're, is in that cervical area, okay? So we do not want to give somebody a, a, a C, a cervical spine injury and put them on a vent for the rest of their lives. So we're maintaining, somebody's maintaining C spine alignment. You've got two people on the side, grabbing at shoulders, hip, hip, lower legs, and on the count of three, my count, head of the bed person, we're going to turn them in unison. One, two, three, turn. And then somebody's looking at the backside, looking to see if there's any pressure that's building up. Because if they're intubated and they're sedated, they're not moving on their own. That's why we got to turn them every two hours, right? We're looking to see if there's any other bruising that has cropped up in the meantime, because not all bruising shows up immediately. We're looking at that, and then on my count of three, when I'm done, we're gonna roll it back. One, two, three, roll. Okay, y'all understand that, right? You understand if somebody's got a seat collar on them, you actually have to, as the nurse, take the front off, assess to make sure, because what's in, what's in, underneath that seat collar? What's right here? <laughs> Their trachea, you're looking for tracheal deviation because they got trauma, you never know when they're gonna drop a lung on you because they can do that. And then we're looking to see if God forbid, like I've had patients come in from um, CBA, um, not CBAs, NBCs, motor vehicle crashes, the windshield breaks. I have found hours later, shards of glass in their hair, underneath their collar, they're buck naked, but I'll find it. Every once in a while, it shows up. And you get glass somewhere around somebody's carotid, you can cut them and they could bleed out on you. So that's why we always have to have somebody at the head of the bed. I'm going to take off the collar, look at the front, then I'm going to, and they'll usually do that while they're rolling them, okay? Because they're killing two birds with one stone. Because patients like this, that's stimulating them. 
And when you aggravate and stimulate a patient with a head trauma, what are you doing to their ICP? Increasing, Increasing, it. Increasing it, okay? So we're rolling them, we're looking at their back, we're looking at their front, we're putting them back down. All right, so at that point, I've got 922. Come back at 